evening. Welcome to Writers on Writing. I am your host, Dr. Brenda Green, and we are coming to you over the airways of 91.5 WMYE. And we come to you every Sunday and give you, our listening audience, an opportunity to hear writers from the African diaspora talk about their work, their lives, and their craft. I'm very pleased to have on the telephone with me today Rosalind Kilkenny McLimont. McLimont? Yes, McLimont. McLimont, yes. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us about your most recent book, The Guyana Contract. Thank you for having me, Brenda. You're welcome. This is really a very uh, riveting novel. I really, really enjoyed reading it and learned a lot. But first, I want to just share with our audience um, your background. Uh, Rosalind Kilkenny McLimont is an award-winning United States journalist. She was born in Guyana and is the author of the groundbreaking rebranding Africa novel, Middle Ground, and the nonfiction title, Africa Strictly Business, The Steady March to Prosperity, published by the network journal, Communications. And you also are the, what do you call the founder of the network journal? The executive editor of the network journal. Okay. And CEO of AfricaStrictlyBusiness.com, which takes its name from the book. Okay. So, again, I am um, really, really pleased to have an opportunity to talk to you uh, about the book, The Guyana Contract, which... Um, it, it just had so many elements in it. You you have the identity politics, you have uh, racism, you have gender, you have suspense, um, the global economy, and um, it centers. I could not keep continue. I uh, continue to think about you in the novel, and I always say writing is autobiographical. I know this is not about you, but why don't we begin by just briefly sharing with the audience the premise of the novel and how you came to write it. The, the premise is a, well, there, as you say, there are several elements, but the main thing is the contract is actually a multinational organization, a multinational company that is looking to seal a contract with Guyana to establish an air transport system in that country. This is an American multinational. Remember, we're fiction. Thanks. This is an American mm -hmm. multinational yes. that wants to have this contract. Within that plot, that's the general one, you have Guyana, the developing country, and you have elements in that country that are suspicious of the motives of this multinational corporation. And so you have that, that kind of tension. Within all of that, you have a young woman, a young, Afri a young African American woman of Guyanese roots, who steps out on her own into the global arena. She becomes part of the negotiating process for this contract representing the multinational corporation. And within that, you have the story of a young black woman who must navigate through the corporate world navigate through corporate politics and also trying to negotiate the global arena even though she has these roots in Guyana she uh, cannot find traction initially with the difference in the cultures and all of that uh, of course it's a fictional work and so for fiction you have a love interest another character the male character the male protagonist is an a French born whose parents are African-American. And these two young people, the young woman and this young man, they meet in France years before the whole contract plot evolves. And so they finally uh, come to each other, but on different sides, on opposite sides of the negotiations for the contract. And it proceeds from there. I won't say what the end is. I won't say what happens in their relationship. But you do have, again, a young woman, black woman, na navigating the corporate process, the corporate arena, and the global arena. A young black woman meeting someone, a black person from a different culture, 
you have within that an, uh, a, a developing country that has to deal with the influence of a multinational corporation. And those are some of the themes within the premise okay. of the contract. So moving from there, your, what was your motivation behind writing this well, novel? You know, I, first of all, I chose Guyana because it is, I was born and bred there. I left there when I was 14. But what I wanted to do was continue the conversation that I started in my first novel, Middle Ground, of developing countries. Who decides the fate of a developing country? And so as an international reporter, that's my training. I'm, a, I'm an international business reporter. I am conversant with all of the issues involved in the, the struggle of developing countries to assert their place in the world, to advance economically, sometimes on their own, sometimes being subject to the pressures of the international financial system, the international trade system, and, of course, international investment that they need. The investors come in with demands. And so I wanted to have that conversation. Uh, it's part of the, 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 my daily work. The other thing I wanted to do in this novel, again, bringing together the experiences of black people in the diaspora who meet each other from the different cultures. So you have African American meeting a Caribbean, African American meeting a Euro, a European, uh, a, a black person, and how do those interactions flow? What are the tensions or what are the similarities? What happens when you have that? So all of these very real issues that we are dealing with today, those are the kinds of issues that I wanted to bring out in a kind of a conversation that is entertaining, exciting, but at the same time provocative raising the questions that we raise within our own communities. So that was my inspiration. Just um, moving, from, moving from that, when you look at those, when you look at that, can you see, um, do you see the writer, because you, you s express this in a very um, conscious way, do you see the writer as having a social responsibility? Is there responsibility, or let me ask this another way, what responsibility does the writer have, in your view? You know, I, I don't want to speak generally about this. I, I, I don't want to be so presumptuous. Okay. For myself, however, for myself, I do feel it is my responsibility to bring out the conversations that a lot of us do not have, either because we're not exposed to those kinds of conversations or because we do not want to. And I feel that by writing, you entertain, yes, but you also inform, you also educate, and, 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 and you, you, you try to not, I don't have all the answers as a writer, but you stimulate conversation so that solutions may be found, so that ways to deal with issues within our community may be found. That, I feel, is a responsibility that I have chosen to assume as a writer. I cannot speak for others. Others may want to write just for entertainment and may feel that I don't have to, you know, I don't have any responsibility to society or anything. And that's fine, but it's my choice to assume the responsibility of educating while entertaining. And as you move from um, making that conscious decision, what have been uh, the, the challenges that you have found in moving from being the, the writer, the international journalist, to move to the genre of fiction? What was that like? What process did you use? Um, how is that different? It, 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 is, it, is, it is different, and yet it is so similar. I always, from the time I was very young in Guyana, I would say about 10 years old, I was fascinated. I wanted to be a writer. 
I always wanted to be a writer. I love to read. I read a lot of fiction uh, and, and a lot of history also. I loved my history teachers, especially one. There was one in particular who just made the old, the, the, the history lessons come alive. I was fascinated. My imagination just, just ran wild. So I always wanted to be a writer. Now, I deliberately chose to go into journalism because I thought that journalism would scientifically improve my, 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 my craft or my calling. I did not want to study English. I did not want to go into English because I thought that, uh, I really thought I did not need anything from being an English major. I thought journalism would take me into a global arena, for example, and that it would always also teach me to write for a lay audience. The writing I do, I want anyone in the street to be able to read it, any ordinary person, and understand what I'm talking about, even though they are not in the, in the universe of, say, the, the World Trade Organization or the International Monetary Fund and all the inner comings and goings and complexities of that world. But I want them to be able to read and understand the context of that world easily. And so I thought journalism would give me that, would give me that ability to craft a story that has no holes, that answers the questions, that paints the picture in a way that anybody can understand. When I was studying journalism, it said we are writing for an eighth grade audience. We are writing for an eighth grade audience. And so imagine someone also, they would ask, they would tell us, imagine someone just landed from Mars. They have no idea what this world is about, but your story must give them the picture and the understanding of what this world is about. And that's why I went from journalism and making that transition because it's not really a transition. It is just a way of exercising the passion for fiction that was already in me, a way of making that fiction come alive and, and in, in, in a better way and, and an easier way for the reader. Okay, so two questions. Who are the people who you read? Who are the fiction writers who inspired you? And secondly, what has it been like to write in fiction? Okay, in terms of inspiration, I read, you know, I read fiction. I read people like Maeve Binchy, who is an Irish writer who has passed, recently passed away, Robert Ludlum. I, 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 I love uh, Terry McMillan's work. I love, there, there, there's so much. I love the kind of work that takes me, the kind of fiction I read that takes me into another culture, that teaches me about the world. Even though it's a fiction, I get to see how people live on the other side of, of, of the world. I go into cultures. And so a lot of the writers, even from when I was, in high school in Guyana, when we studied Dickens, and you study, you know, and David Copperfield, and all of those, those, those old world kinds of things, you get to see how the human being accepts and acknowledges and works within his particular or her particular condition through fiction. So sometimes I would just pick up a book because of the title. The title draws me, a work of fiction draws me. And I might not even remember the name of the writer, but I'm steeped in the, in, 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 in the artwork of this particular writer. And so that's one. And, and the, other, the other question, was it difficult? Is it difficult to, to, to write fiction? Oh, my goodness. You get so absorbed in some of your characters. It's, it's not that it's difficult, because this is something that I love doing. But when you have to shape those characters, you have to go into the head of the characters. Sometimes they take you over. Did the, you know? is, is that what happened? That, this, this, is, this is what happens. When, when, when I'm right, let's say I'm talking about the, the female protagonist, Drusilla Duran, in the Guyana contract. You have to remove all the other characters and their influences 
and get into the head of this particular character of Drusilla Duran. And you ask yourself, how would this person react in this situation? How would her facial expressions be? How would her facial expression be in this particular situation? And this is why I like to, when I'm sitting on the subway, anything that I'm doing in public, I observe people. Because the real world gives me my characters. The real world gives me my characters. I observe people very carefully. I look at how they respond to certain uh, uh, situations in real life. I look at how their eyebrows move, and so I can describe that in, when I'm describing a, a, a particular expression in the book. I study the different characters. And then you separate yourself. You have to get into a male character. And when you go to bed at night, Dr. Green, this character you keep asking yourself, you cannot sleep, because this character, you have to make this character believable for the reader. This has to be an authentic human being in the world, even though it is fiction, you see, because you want your readers to believe what you're saying. And sometimes your readers may see themselves in it. Can a reader, you ask, can a reader see himself or herself in this particular character? And so they're nice when, 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 when I personally, when I'm writing, they're nice when I'm sleepless. And sometimes also I may get to a point where, okay, I can't move any further. And that's when I would pick up a book, a work of fiction, and read it. I always, I read as I write. I read as I write. I listen to certain kinds of music when I write. I practice my, keep practicing my Tai Chi when I write. Because all of this make it easier for the, 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 for, for the ideas to flow and the shaping of the characters to flow, you see. Wow, that's very, a very, very um, descriptive process that you go through. Yes. Part of, of what I, I believe, and I think it, it probably happens more in, in the first novels, is that so much of the writing, of course, it draws on our own experiences, but it's also autobiographical. And you are a chief executive officer of, a, of an organization, and I, I have to ask, to, in, to what extent is this novel autobiographical? There are parts of it that are, forgive that chiming, there are parts of it that are. The very beginning, for example, where you see the, the, the character traveling across Europe, first of all, going to Europe to study, and then taking a journey across Europe and almost being kidnapped. That happened. That, that, is, that, is, that draws from my own particular uh, experience. When I was in college, I, decide, I wanted to go to graduate school to do Latin American studies, and I could not do that because I was told my Spanish was not strong enough. And so I went to Spain, to the University of Madrid, to immerse myself in the language. And after that, I bought a Eurail pass and went across Europe. The experiences that the female character, Drusilla Duran, has when she's locked in this room and had to break the door down, I was traveling with uh, a, another a sister that I met at the University of Madrid. We had that very experience where we were locked in and had to break down the door and all of that. So there's that part. In terms of some of the, subtle, the subtleties of racism that one experiences in the corporate arena, I have experienced some of that indeed. And then listening to the stories of women because as as executive editor of the Network Journal, I have the privilege of writing the profiles and learning about the women that we honor every year. And so that is something, those stories, those stories, and they're so similar, where they talk about, even though they're in very high positions, what they have to go through. And then, of course, many of the other, uh, in my reporting experience, on the, 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 the influence of multinational corporations and how they invest in smaller countries and so on. All of that comes from the work that I do 
as an international reporter. And so, yes, some of it is biographical. Yes, some of it is from the stories I glean from others in the course of my work. And yes, some of it, the stories, the experiences that I write about in my reporting. Right. Now, you say that it was important, it was important to you that we have these conversations. Moving from that, what message can we give to our public about, for example, what the black female executive faces? Oh my How do goodness. we handle being in, in a situation where we are on these, maybe on these boards? How do we handle this very, very political world at the international level? But let, let's start with the, the, the black female executive. Mm -hmm. Because that is that is a challenge. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. It is. It certainly is a challenge. And in this book, you do not see Drusilla Duran, the female protagonist, with a support system of sisters, of 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 of, uh, of other women in the same position. She's very much a loner. Yes. You see, and she has to. She pulls this out of herself. The way she deals with it, she has a brother whom she speaks to, but she chose also not to speak to the brother about some of these uh, issues that she was facing, and she could not speak to anyone in the organization also about these, these, these racist remarks that her so-called mentor uh, was, was using, because she said, who would believe her? Who was she? Who was she compared to this major figure, this major personality within the organization? So she kept a lot to herself and worked it out. And what helped her is, and this is very important, I think, for me in terms of black female executives and the support that she gets from males, you will see that. One, she encounters someone who gave her the courage to take a certain step in the end, right? Yes. And you see also that in the course of, of her dealing with this contract in Guyana, she also had the support of, well, from the very beginning, she had the support of her father, who even though he was upset because she was going to Europe, he still did something that showed he was with her all the way. And then she had her brother who did give support. And then she, there was, the, the, there was the, uh, the, the character in Guyana who recognized her as a, me an ex a member of the ex his extended family and who in his own way gave her support. So you have these male characters who supported her. And of course you have her mother who supported her. But then, in the end, the battle was within herself. She is the one that had to make the decisions, that had to deal with the issues in within herself, first of all, and then expressing her inner decision, expressing them in action. So the whole, the, 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 the female executive, the female, the black female executive has a lot of internal struggle in spite of the support that you get. Yes, that helps. Male, female, yes, that helps. But in the final analysis, it is always you. You are the determinant of your fate and of your future. I strongly believe that. And so you have the power in you to make the decisions to set yourself to, to go forward, I believe. How do you gather that? How do you do that in an environment that's hostile? I mean, your character does that. Um, she pulls on other people. But mm -hmm. What message do you have to others? Because this is, is in the executive. This is in the business world. This is in higher education. Mm -hmm. This is in private mm -hmm. industry. This is all over. This is something yes. that women yes. face. Mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. do, how do they move beyond that? Again, I, 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 I really believe in inner strength. I am writing another book called uh, Chocolate for Wall Street. And it deals, this is another fiction, but it deals with women of color who are put in a situation to 
of, of, of adversity with each other. They're competitors for a particular position, and how do they deal with it? These are three executive women of color, and their stories within the corporate arena, and, you, and I talk about where they get their support from. But I maintain, Dr. Green, I maintain that in the final analysis, it is the strength inwardly. And how do you build that strength? I believe having faith, faith in God, whoever or however you define God to be. I believe in that. I believe in faith in yourself as a part of a universe that is really, really kind to you. A universe that you can draw from, you can draw sustenance from if you give it the respect that it deserves. I believe in pulling out of yourself. I believe in sitting and reflecting, not blaming external forces or other people. Whenever you confront a situation, I believe you reflect, how could I have dealt with this differently? As we see in the book, in the Guyana Contract, when Drusilla realizes that the way she dealt with a particular situation caused the result that she did not want to have. You see, so it, you, you ask, how do you do that? I go inward. When I confronted that in a, in, in, in a position, in, in, a, in a job that I had as a senior editor uh, prior to the Network Journal, of course, I used what I learned in Tai Chi. I used what I learned from my father, who was a Rosicrucian, and a very quiet, inward person who taught me how to go inward and how to use the strength and the forces and the cap capabilities that we have that we don't realize we have. And so I, I have many friends and acquaintances, but I too am a loner like, like Trusilla Duran. I go in. I go in. That is how I do it, and that is how... I try to make my characters do it because that is the message that I want to put forward, that we as individuals, we have that internal strength to overcome anything. Yes, we benefit from support and love and the embrace of others. That helps. That helps to strengthen us. But in the final analysis, we have it within us. Very, very inspirational ending message to our readers. I have been talking with Rosalind Kilkenny McLimont, and she is the author of The Guyana Contract, a, a very powerful novel that takes us into the world of global politics, the world of Guyana. And the characters um, are people who I am sure some of you can relate to. I thank you for writing this book. Thank you for your leadership in the writing world and for illustrating uh, for, to us how we can live the life of the writer, yes. fiction and, uh, and journalism. Yes. And congratulations on this book. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. Thank you for having me on the show. And I hope that, uh, that your audience will find some kind of inspiration within all the words that I, that I gave today and that they will read the book. It's available on Amazon.com, of course, digital format as well as hard copy. Okay, thank you. And remember, the writer is always reading, the reader is always writing. Keep reading and writing. Empower yourselves as readers and writers. Go out and purchase the Guyana contract. You've been listening to Dr. Brenda Green, Executive Director of the Center for Black Literature at Megar Evers College.